So is the Earth alive a planetary odyssey? To begin with, it seems quite a provocative question. Of course the Earth isn't alive. Of course a planet can't be a living thing. We can make lots of analogies, maybe strike some similarities between uh, a planet with a widespread biosphere and maybe a single organism, a single cell perhaps. But really, it doesn't seem to be much process or progress to be made in thinking about to what extent the Earth actually is alive. But hopefully over the next 45 minutes or so, I hope to convince you that this is actually a sensible question to consider. And I'm going to begin, not at the planetary scale, but something much, much smaller. It may be doubted whether there are many other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world as have these lowly organised creatures. Can anyone imagine what Darwin is talking about? Does anybody actually know the answer? Right, shut up. Um, can, anybody, can anybody guess? <laughs> any, any, any suggestions as to what Darwin is referring to? You've most probably know this, but you've forgotten, which is kind of the same as, as knowing it. Anyway, <laughs> it's no, I didn't. oh, right, excellent. It's the humble worm. Um, Darwin wrote a book. I think it was his last book that he published in 1881 or maybe 1882. The vegetable mould and earthworms. He was he was an expert on the function and the role of worms. Why was he so interested in worms? Well, one of the reasons he is interested in worms is because uh, phosphorus is important. So this is a molecule that you're most probably familiar with. This is DNA. And phosphorus, these represented these little yellow balls, is a component in the, the backbone, the major and minor groove of DNA. So it's very important. If you don't have phosphorus, you won't be able to uh, repair cells, you won't be able to reproduce. Phosphorus is a necessary requirement for life, at least on this planet, life as we know it. And phosphorus on this planet started off in rocks. Um, and somehow, uh, that phosphorus atom gets into the biosphere. It typically gets into the biosphere via a primary producer, something like a tree, or maybe a lichen or a moss or something. Uh, once it gets into uh, that organism, that organism can then be eaten by other things. So for example, a caterpillar comes along and eats a leaf off the tree. A bird comes along and then eats the caterpillar. And then after a long and wonderful life, the bird demises. Um, but the phosphorus atom isn't lost because what comes along are decomposing organisms which render down what was previously a bird into its constituent atoms. And then the important role of the worm comes into play because what the worm does through its tunneling and burrowing around, it mixes up inorganic matter with organic matter and significantly increases the possible productivity of a unit area of land. So if you go onto uh, Southampton Common and if you were to start digging, you would find many, many worms. And if those worms weren't there, then the productivity of that land would be much, much less than it is. So hence Darwin's appreciation of the importance that worms play with regards to this particular cycle and the ability of that cycle to support life. The thing is, um, that's not just a terrestrial process, so there's a kind of a recycling uh, activity that goes on, but eventually that phosphorus atom will be lost off the land. It gets into a little stream, which goes into a river, maybe a lake, but then ultimately it'll make its way to the sea. But then when it's in the sea, a whole series of kind of trophic cascades or trophic webs can happen again, where that little phosphorus atom forms the basis for things that eat phosphorus and then things that eat phosphorus and then things, etc., etc. But then once again, ultimately, those things will die, uh, they'll fall to the bottom of the sea, and that phosphorus atom will be lost to the biosphere. So there's a very kind of slow input of phosphorus into the biosphere, and there's a very slow loss of phosphorus from the biosphere. So this notion of recycling is as old as there's been life on Earth, because when you look at the recycling ratios of things like phosphorus on the Earth, you'll see that it's many, many times greater than you imagine in an abiotic system. If all life on Earth was limited to the flux of phosphorus and other limiting nutrients from rocks, there wouldn't be anything like the amount of biomass that we see on the Earth. So they're very, very sophisticated recycling networks or recycling systems that keep hold of essential nutrients in the biosphere for as long as they possibly can. And worms are important, but arguably things like this are much more important. So microbial organisms, you know, bacteria and fungi, the decomposers, these really do drive the biogeochemical cycles. So here we've got the phosphorus cycle, so you've got uplifting of rock and then uh, the weathering of it releases these phosphorus atoms and then it kind of goes around and around in different cycles. We've got the nitrogen cycle, uh, the sulphur cycle and the carbon cycle. <coughs> 
And these are, or they can be, quite tremendously complicated, kind of systems of feedbacks or loops, um, almost kind of have a regulating uh, nature. So how did these systems arise? How did these very complicated, seemingly quite finely crafted recycling systems emerge on planet Earth? Well, as well as being an expert on worms, Darwin also knew a few things about finches. And during his journeys around the world, he realized that uh, you can look at a particular kind of ancestral finch, and if you look at how it becomes adapted over time, then you can begin to understand how biological complexity can emerge on planet Earth. The inheritance of uh, certain genetically carried characteristics and natural selection operating on these kind of diverse populations. So that might be able to explain biological complexity or why we may see um, finely crafted processes going on in particular organisms, but it's not really much help when it comes to understanding complicated biogeochemical processes or processes operating at the scale of a planet. Because there hasn't been any population of reproducing planets, and so you can't invoke evolutionary mechanisms, at least Darwinist uh, mechanisms, to explain how the Earth, from a lump of kind of molten rock, has, over geological time, become quite complicated or complex. So why is the Earth the way it is? Well, one solution is simple luck. We've just been very fortunate to live on the kind of planet that we do, so this encaptures the notion of the habitable zone. Um, Mars, well, it's too small and it lost its atmosphere, but it's also maybe too far away from the sun, so it's too cold. Venus is about the same size as the Earth, but it's a bit nearer. It's got this horrible runaway greenhouse atmosphere and it's far too hot. So maybe Earth landing in the green habitable zone was just lucky. Furthermore, if you've got a very large number of potential Earths in the universe, then maybe you know, the vast majority don't have highly complicated biogeochemical cycles. Maybe we're just a bit lucky. And you can throw in some kind of anthropic principles, which may try to give some kind of explanatory mechanisms as to why the Earth is the way it is. But there's also something else. Because as well as being in the right kind of place um, in space, the Earth seems to have navigated a particular route in time so uh, this is pretty much the present, and this is going back about 540 million years ago. And this bar represents the, the width of that bar represents the number of living families, the number of different types of species there are on the Earth. And you'll see that there are these big extinction events where the number of families uh, significantly decreases. And in, some, uh, and in some of these extinction events, you know, over 50% of all known species were going extinct through some kind of cataclysm. But no matter how bad it was, it never went down to no families. Okay, so everything that's alive on Earth today is related to everything else. And if we go back far enough in time, we'll most probably find a common ancestor. We all have the same genetic code. It's very strong evidence for all life on Earth being related. And it's quite strong evidence for all life being able to, man being able to navigate this period all the way back to the origins of life, maybe two, three, maybe even 3.8 billion years ago, depending on who you talk to. So, if you've got time and you've got some notion of a habitable zone, the Earth has kind of wandered around within it, but it's never sort of fallen off the edge at any one particular time. Why is that? Well, some people have proposed, as well as being lucky, the Earth may actually be self-stabilizing or homeostatic. It reduces the impacts of perturbations. It kind of increases the likelihood that it's going to stay within this zone that's compatible for a widespread biosphere. Pretty much like a, uh, a central heating system in your home. Why would somebody think that? Well, one, it's not exactly evidence, but it's one reason to think that the Earth may have these properties, is because the sun, um, as it evolves over time, as it gets older, it gets brighter. So, since the formation of the Earth, the brightness of the sun has increased by about 25%. But there hasn't been a commensurate 25% increase of temperatures on the surface of the planet. And there are some other processes, some bioge biogeochemical processes, that people have proposed exhibit these kind of self-stabilizing or homeostatic properties. And the topic of today's talk is the one that was formulated by Jim Lovelock and Lynn Margulis, called the Gaia Hypothesis, or now the Gaia Theory. And the Gaia theory itself has evolved somewhat. Um, arguably, there's no one Gaia theory. But the way I want to present it or describe it is from the basis of some very, very simple assumptions. This is how I come at it. 
The first assumption is that the environment affects life. So if you envisage the environment, all the kind of abiotic conditions, the surface temperature, the salinity of a liquid or something, that has some kind of impact on life. And in a sense, life uh, fits its environment, is adapted to its environment. So life, you know, this key actually has been adapted in order to fit the particular tumblers of this lock. And we see that in obvious examples, such as this polar bear. This polar bear is highly adapted to that particular environment. It would certainly look out of place wouldn't last very long if it was to live in an environment like this. So there are clear uh, situations in which we can understand how environmental conditions shape or modify or mould the kind of organisms that reside within them. But then there's another kind of process that goes the other way. So here we've got a tree um, and this tree is modifying its environment. It's providing a basis for other things to live on. So you've got lichen and moss that's growing on its trunk and on its bark but then it's also having important local climatic effects. So it's got deep roots that go down into the soil and draw up water and then it evapotranspirates that water at the top and can increase cloud cover. So there are important kind of micro -lo local climatic uh, impacts that trees have. This is a classic structure from a niche constructing species. So this is a beaver's dam. And the beavers chop down trees and they make these big rafts, these big dams, in order to provide habitat for themselves. And in doing so, they provide habitat for other species. Fish can now live in that lake. And they also exclude other species, because um, non-aquatic species can no longer live in that area, which is now a lake. But more profound are the impacts that much smaller things have. So here we have some cyanobacteria. Uh, and these are doing kind of uh, photosynthesis within the kind of uh, the sheaths of their cells. And it was the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis a couple of billion years ago, perhaps, that led to the tremendous increase in oxygen, molecular reactive oxygen that we have in the atmosphere today. In fact, if it wasn't for organisms like this, we wouldn't be able to exist because we need quite high partial pressures of oxygen. And it's, um, there's very strong evidence that organisms such as the cyanobacteria, algae, things that photosynthesize, in the absence of them, we would never have the amount of oxygen that we do in the Earth's atmosphere. And it's in that context that current global environmental change concerns, such as anthropogenic climate change, should be seen. We're not doing anything really special. We're affecting or modifying our environment as a byproduct, but then pretty much all organisms do. Because in order to be alive, you've got to run a metabolism. So if you need to run a metabolism, you've got to eat something. And if you've got to eat something, that means you're going to the toilet. You have to take in low entropy food and you excrete high entropy waste. That could be chemical waste or it could even be heat. So you necessarily affect your environment. So really the system we've got is yes, the environment affects life, but then life affects environment. We have a coupled co-evolving system. And that system can do something that's interesting and perhaps surprising and maybe even homeostatic. And really, when it comes to the, the sort of required assumptions, there's not a great deal more that you need. However, as you're most probably aware, Gaia theory in its various incarnations has been very, very controversial. Um, here's an example uh, that, well, this is what John Maynard Smith thought about it at one point. <coughs> he kind of reconciled himself with Jim Lovell later on, but in a way, one reason that there was such a strong reaction against Gaia is because a lot of this was happening in the late 1970s and, late, late, and the 1980s when there were these big wars, Darwin wars about the notions of group selection, um, uh, high level selection. There was a lot of unfortunate theorising, there was a lot of rubbish around and unfortunately Gaia got associated with some notions of holistic uh, high level selection which basically didn't make a great deal of sense from a Darwinist perspective and it kind of got caught up in the crossfire. It also didn't help itself with some of the associations it kept, some of the kind of crystal twiddling hippie fringe that's not really science but there was a very strong reaction. The thing that I've got is that I'm particularly interested in Gaia and I'm also interested in it from a complex systems point of view. And John wasn't very enthusiastic about that either. He, um, I'll, I'll lead you to work out what the asterisks are covering up, but he had quite strong opinions on complexity theory as well. He didn't think it was particularly, uh, he didn't actually think it was science. There wasn't enough empirical basis for it. So we've got Gaia theory and complex systems, you know, uh, 
we've got telepathy and levitation. This is a potentially combustible mix if we're talking about science. So it's very important that we try to proceed on some simple, generally agreed assumptions and so we don't get lost in all the fog. We don't get lost in the fog of war. So I'm going to talk about this thing called Daisy World that was concocted by Jim Lovelock back in 19... Uh, I think the first publication was in 1981. And he and his then PhD student, Andy Watson, uh, developed this simple little model that was designed in order to demonstrate some self-regulating or homeostatic properties of an Earth system which didn't fall foul of any of the pitfalls that you may think some of these theories have. And the emphasis and the motivation is providing some kind of mechanism. We can't use um, Darwinian evolution to understand how complicated biogeochemical processes emerge, how those processes could be self-regulating, let alone how a planetary system could be self-regulating. But maybe there are other kinds of mechanisms. Maybe there are other kinds of mechanisms that are, emerge from the kind of assumptions that I've just been talking about. So, they imagine this world called Daisy World. It's an Earth-sized planet, but it's grey, and has a very simple biosphere. It's just got two types of life. It's got white daisies and black daisies. And their thought experiment starts with tiny little white daisies and tiny little black daisies on the surface of this planet. So they're kind of in the soil and they're dormant. And the variable of interest is this uh, planetary temperature variable. So how do they incorporate the fact that the environment has an effect on life? Well, they do that by saying that the growth rate of these little daisies, these little simple life forms, is some function of their temperature. So they grow well around 22 degrees, but then it can get too hot or too cold where they don't grow at all. And either side of that, there's a kind of progressive decrease in their growth rate. How do the simple life forms interact and affect their environment? Well, because they've got different colours, um, they have a different albedo, they reflect different amounts of energy or radiation from the sun. So all things equal, if you have the planet temperature here, then it will change as the proportional coverage of black daisies change. Basically, if you've got more and more black daisies on the surface of the planet, as the planet is getting darker and darker, it will warm the planet up. And the inverse with white daisies. As you increase the proportional coverage of the white daisies, you're reflecting more sunlight away back into space, and you're going to make it colder and colder. So, as well as having um, kind of Earth-like properties, it orbits a sun-like star, which over about 4 billion years gets brighter by about 25%. So, they did a whole series of simple numerical simulations, and then later on there have been some analytical solutions. But the story is that on a dead planet that doesn't really change, there's an approximately linear relationship with temperature and time. So over time, the star is getting brighter, and so we should expect, and indeed we do see, the temperature on the surface of the planet gets hotter, okay, it increases. Things change when you have these little black and white daisies. When you do that, then again there's an initial uh, progressive increase, but then there's a sudden increase, and the temperature gets kind of fixed at some point, and then there's another sudden increase again before it snaps back to this sort of abiotic solution. And if you run that again, that change in temperature corresponds to a change in albedo, suddenly dark, becoming lighter and lighter and lighter until it's almost white, and then suddenly back down to grey again. So what was it doing? Well, uh, so here we've got luminosity, all the brightness of the star over time, and this is the temperature of the planet. And this is the temperature of the planet with no daisies, so this is the dead planet. Um, but when you've got both daisies, there's a sudden increase in temperature. It gets kind of stabilised around this region, and then there's a sudden increase. And the reason you get that stabilisation, or homeostasis, of planetary temperature is because there's a differential coverage in the black and white daisies. There's an initial kind of population explosion of black daisies, and then they decrease, and there's a commensurate increase in the number of white daisies. So it's the change in the balance of the black daisies to the white daisies, which changes the albedo of the planet, so it's getting lighter and lighter over time. And as it's getting lighter and lighter over time, it's able to offset some of the increases in the luminosity coming down from the star. So, this is all ancient history really. Um, it was the basis of my doctoral research. And uh, we did some work about it, but then in 2008 I collaborated with some people on a review. And so it was published in 2008, Reviews of Geophysics, because 
During the preceding years, I mean, this model was first produced in, first published in that form in 1982. And over the years, there'd been further extensions and refinements. So as well as daisies, there'd been rabbits that eat the daisies, and then fox that eats the rabbits, and then there'd been different types of topologies, uh, different types of stars. And it felt like every other month someone was producing another paper that wasn't really saying a great deal about it. So we said, we'll draw a line under this, and in 2008 we published the paper, and let's not do any more of this, let's go on and do something else. Well, yes, unsurprisingly, I continue to publish papers about Daisy World. I haven't just produced papers about Daisy World, I have done other things too, but, um, you know, there was the Daisy World and Guy and thermodynamics, then there was um, Daisy World and more control systems, and then there's Ian Weaver, my PhD student. But, you know, after a while you realise you're just kind of negotiating or in denial. There's a reason why I keep coming back to this. There's a reason why I keep producing yet more simple models of representations. And the reason is, I think I finally convinced myself, is that this is actually quite important. So, how does Daisy World work? What is its control system? Well, um, it works like this. So although the black daisies and the white daisies, they share the same kind of growth rate, because the black daisies are a little bit warmer than the bare ground and the white daisies are a little bit cooler, they, they kind of separate out their responses for a given particular planet temperature. Um, as the coverage of black daisies increase, well, they have an increasing effect on planetary temperature. And as the coverage of the white daisies increase, well, they have a decreasing effect on planetary temperature. So what happens is you have your planetary temperature kind of fixed within these two opposing systems. And it's a system which we can call a rain control system. Because to steer a horse, you need two reins. If you want to go left, you pull one. If you want to go right, you pull the other. These are kind of unidirectional reins. You can only kind of pull them in one direction. So if you want to control this system, both left and right, then you need two reins, which are operating in this kind of unidirectional control system context. But it's a trick. There's a sleight of hand that's been performed. There's a little couple of assumptions that have been smuggled in. Uh, one of the people who's, um, in a way, most developed the theory is a guy called James Kirchner, who came from a philosophy geology background and over a number of years, most probably decades now, has published uh, papers, attended conferences, and has been something of a long-standing critic of Gaia theory, much to the benefit of the theory and, I would say, science in general. Um, and so there are a series of papers in climatic change. This one's from 2000 and pixel. Uh, 2003, I think, um, where he identified a number of these kind of assumptions that have got smuggled in in the original Daisy world, which allows the system to work. And I can kind of explain it like this. Um, this is a schematic of the control system. So you've got the star, which is affecting the temperature of the planet via the albedo of the planet, which then goes on to affect the temperatures of the black and white daisies, and then that affects their growth. But you can simplify all that. Really, all you need is a star affecting on some environmental variable, the temperature, which affects some kind of organisms, which are the black and white daisies. So there's a feedback loop here, and that system is being affected or being nudged or perturbed by some external perturbing force. And you can look at the different ways you could wire that system up. So uh, this is daisy world. So as it gets colder, as there's a negative impact, the daisies, black daisies, grow more. So it has an increasing effect on the, the temperature. So that's a negative feedback loop. So that's going to self-stabilize. As it gets hotter, then the white daisies are going to have a decreasing effect on the temperature. And that's another negative feedback loop. But what about the other two? What about a situation where you could have runaway uh, positive feedback loops here and here? <coughs> so that corresponds to a situation where you kind of flip the daisies around now. Rather than the black daisies doing better than the white daisies when it's cold, now the white daisies do better than the black daisies when it's cold. But what that means is, is as soon as we're over in this region, the temperature is going to ping off this way. It's going to get very, very cold. And similarly, as soon as you're over into this region, there's going to be a kind of a runaway feedback that way. The system is going to fly away in positive feedback, either increasing or decreasing. Explain that guidance, said Kirchner. Well, there is another explanation, but it kind of reverts back to chance. Because now you say, well, maybe there are lots of planets with biogeochemical processes, and some of them are overall positive feedback, and some are overall negative feedback. Maybe we're just lucky enough to live on a planet with negative feedback. 
and then we can also invoke some anthropic um, principles in order to have um, complicated, complex organisms with big brains, uh, very energy-hungry brains that can ask questions such as, well, why do we have predominant negative feedbacks? You need stability. There has to be periods in which uh, the environmental conditions are relatively benign, so you have lots of time in order to evolve things like that. If the system was continually flying off with positive feedback all the time, you know, it's getting really hot and the biosphere was dying out and it had to recover from scratch, then we wouldn't see complicated, complex organisms like us to answer these kinds of questions, or at least to ask them. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's not wrong, is it? But it doesn't feel particularly satisfying. Fortunately, you don't need any luck. In fact, you will see the emergence of homeostatic brain control systems uh, in, in, under a wide range of assumptions, and it's really, in one sense, inevitable. I can describe it like this. So here we've got a representation of the black and white daisies. Um, so these are the black daisies, and they do better when it's colder, but now we've got some kind of abstract environmental variable. Um, so there's a little arrow, so it's pushing it this way. And now the white daisies, rather than show them on the same uh, kind of dimension, uh, this, these are the effects they're having. So these are increasing effects on the variable, and these are decreasing effects on the variable. So now as we increase the variable, these have got a kind of decreasing effect that way. So it's a rain control system. So what's the probability we're going to see something like that? Well, the thing is you don't need just individuals. Let's imagine that we've got 100 kind of these simple types of daisies. And let's allow us to create them such that some like it cold, some like it hot, some have an increasing effect, some have a decreasing effect. And we sort of fill the space of all the kind of uh, conditions they can, they can live under. So the assumption here is there is some kind of range of environmental variable values within which anything can live. And within that range, we just assume that something will live. So this one over here, this has a strong increasing effect. Uh, and it likes it really hot. This one over here, this has a strong decreasing effect and it likes it really cold. And then what you do, you just look at the total effect that all those individuals have. And we visualize that with this black solid line. Yeah? Now, when the black solid line undergoes a zero crossing from positive to negative, denoted by these circles, that is actually a homeostatic rain control state. Because if we try to perturb the environmental variable now. If I'm at this va value here and now I try and make it colder, well, there's a net response to the population such that the net effect is an increasing uh, action on the environmental variable, and so it kind of moves it back down again. What that means in the original Daisy World context is, so this is the perturbing force. So you could think about this as the brightness of the star. And this is the biotic force, that solid black line that we just looked at. So you might think about this as maybe the albedo of the planet, the effect the organisms are having as a population on the variable. And it, there's an equal but opposite sign. So as that's getting uh, larger and larger positively, that's becoming larger and larger negatively. And what that means is that on an abiotic planet, so there's no biotic components, this is a dead planet, there'd be this kind of increase in environmental variable values. What we see, the situation, is that it gets stabilised. It ends up in these kind of self-regulating homeostatic states. Now, why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting anyway. You should all be nodding. That's interesting, James. It's also interesting from a kind of Darwinian perspective because the environmental variable, remember the environmental variable is affecting the organisms. And there are sort of, I presented a version of this model where everything exists at the start, but there are evolutionary uh, versions where you start with a relatively small number and then you can evolve them over time. But basically, as the environmental variable is increasing, what we should see is a kind of a simple selective sweep through the population. So when it's cold, the ones that do best when it's cold are at high abundances. And then as you increase the environmental variable, you'll see a commensurate change in the population. Yeah. Um, but that's not what happens. The system doesn't respond to that selection pressure. It seems as if it's kind of s s responding to this kind of pressure. But that pressure isn't being operated upon by individuals. That's a, that's a cumulative, that's a sum total effect that all the individuals are having. So as a population, they're responding quite strongly to change in environmental conditions. But they're doing it in a way which leads to the regulation or stabilization of those environmental conditions. And there's other things you can do with simple models like this. It doesn't really matter what the response functions are. So we've just looked at a simple model that's got Gaussian responses, uh, but they could be skew, bimodal, parabolic. The only assumption that you need is they're somehow well-bounded. 
it either is too hot or it's too cold, and somewhere in between they can grow. Whether it's unimodal, there's an optimal condition, or whether it can wiggle about. For the analysis, it doesn't actually matter. It also doesn't matter how many particular organisms you have beyond a certain number. So in that respect, a more complex uh, system, maybe a more complex ecosystem, is not less stable or less likely to be stable. So here we've got the number of bio biotic elements or the number of different types of daisies. Um, and it's logarithmic here, so it goes from 1 to 200 over there. And this is the expected number of stable points, those kind of zero crossings on that black line where the little circles were. And yes, yeah, so as you increase from very small numbers, uh, the number of expected stable points increase, but it gets to a value, you know, order of around 100, where it doesn't make any difference. You don't see a decrease in the number of expected stable states, the number of times it undergoes a zero crossing. What actually determines the total number of stable states is the width of the uh, particular botic response functions. Well, that's all about in a kind of daisy world context. But these simple sorts of models, you can extend them into two dimensions, or even more. So now, rather than a kind of uh, a line over environmental space, now we've got these Gaussian functions on a plane. So this has an increasing effect on the environmental one, that's as decreasing. And then you visualize those as this kind of undulating surface. So maybe this metaphor is a bit easier, because if you were to initialize the environmental variable at a peak, it would end up rolling down and falling into one of these uh, little valleys, which is the classic. Um, example or metaphor for an attractor landscape. This is another one. So again, this is a two environmental variable system. These circles are where the fixed points are, the attractive fixed points. And so you follow the arrows around and you'll come to a particular fixed point there. One of the reasons I find this interesting is because the ultimate destination can be very, very far away from when you start and you can get very interesting dynamics, you know, spirals, uh, a kind of progressive unwinding over time, even from such a very simple model. What about four dimensions? What about four environmental variables? You can initialize a four environmental variable system, and after a while, it will settle down into some kind of uh, attractor, and then you can maybe hit it with a hammer. So at uh, time equals 50, we just displace this environmental variable by a large amount. And it, and it undergoes a period of kind of reorganization until it ends up into some other kind of stable state. Who's heard of Her Ashby's homeostat? OK, that's essentially Ashby's homeostat. You've got uh, the, the four units which are wired up um, and interacting, and it will thrash around until it finds a stable state. <coughs> the interesting dynamics are going on in here, um, and you can show that through this figure, which is, a sort of, uh, which is a simple numerical simulation of the model. So now we've got the abundance of individuals, however many there are, but about 10. And this is at one stable state, and basically we whacked it with a hammer here. And the system is now thrashing around until it finds another stable state. So in a homeostat context, this is sort of like the actuation of the uniselector, going through uh, its lookup table of different uh, interaction coefficients. Or another way to look at it is that the biotic elements here are kind of s trying to solve the solutions for the derivatives of those environmental variables. They're trying to work out what their relative abundance have to be so that the rate of change of the environmental variables hits zero. OK, that's all very well and good. But what about something a bit more applied, or maybe even in the real world? So as well as the planetary scale homeostasis, I think um, simple models or simple representations of these uh, systems may be more applicable at a regional or a subplanetary scale. So I'm going to talk about eutrophication in lakes. So this is a lake in China, and it's undergone a process of eutrophication. So this is full of choking algae. How did it get there? Well, um, you've got phosphorus input rate into that lake. And the phosphorus, as you know, is essential for life. And uh, it's a component in fertilizer. So in many regions in China, they are putting a lot of phosphorus fertilizer on the ground. There are different kind of schemes, government incentives, and they're basically throwing it on. And it's got to the point where it's like pushing on a bit of string. Um, and what we find is that as the phosphorus input into the rate, phosphorus input rate increases because it's being washed off the agricultural land going into the lake, there is a commensurate increase in the concentration of phosphorus in the lake water. So as you go and sample it, you can see it's increasing over time. And there's this region here where the increase in concentrations 
uh, with respect to the in input is nice and smooth and linear and easy to understand. But there comes a point here, it's a fold one, or it's a fold bifurcation, so fold one, that a small increase leads it to this eutrophic state. It suddenly transitions from a nice clear water state with loads of different types of plants and animals to this choking algal state where not a great deal else is alive. And the trouble that the lake managers have, or the people who now want to get anything from that lake, is that getting back from that eutrophic state requires a relatively large decrease in the phosphorus input all the way to this fold bifurcation where the system is going to hopefully snap back relatively quickly. So that loop is a hysteresis loop. So it's a hysteresis loop because the state of the system is dependent not just on a simple variable but what its previous history was. And there are lots of hysteresis loops, there are lots of these systems that exhibit these uh, fold bifurcations or sometimes called critical transitions or tipping points. And so one of my motivations is to produce simple mechanistic models in order to explore those dynamics. So this is that simple model with two environmental variables. And you can see for a portion of the phase space when the actual values of the perturbations don't really matter here, but this is just how strongly we are affecting environmental one or environmental variable two. For regions of it, as you increase or seek to increase environmental variable two, there's a nice kind of smooth progressive increase here gets a bit deformed there, but as we go in towards this region and then we begin to increase, you can see there are these kind of discontinuous uh, first or second order phase transitions where you'll be on this limb and then you suddenly transition up here and then to get back we have to go through a relatively large hysteresis loop. So you can look at those um, simple kind of dynamics. You can also look at to what extent you might get some early warning that these critical transitions are happening. So uh, if the projector wants to show it. So these are the dynamics of the critical transition going this way and that way. And these are analogues of something called critical slowing down. So these are giving you some kind of indication that the system is approaching some kind of tipping point. It's approaching some kind of critical transition. One of the interesting things is because we can completely control the dynamics, we can look to see how does the early warning signal vary here when we're just about to undertake a potentially large and hard reverse change to here when we're about to undertake a maybe not so large but generally reversible change. Sometimes it's very hard to tell, sometimes it's impossible to tell um, um, and I think there's, there's an awful lot that simple models like this can have to inform the current scientific project about to what extent can we predict some of these tipping points. Um, so rather than do further analysis of time series data, generate simple process-based models and see what kind of early warning signals they produce. Okay. So tipping points, critical transitions. We have a simple model now in which uh, it's got a rain control system which emerge as a, just a consequence of random individuals increasing or decreasing. Um, but now I want to consider the situation that was considered bad, the positive feedback analog. So at the moment, this one is having a decreasing effect and this one is having an increasing effect. What if you swap the arrows round? So what if now this has a decreasing effect and this has an increasing effect? Well, obviously, any small perturbation that way, and it's going to lead to a relatively rapid transition to this very low value. I think there's an interesting analog with something that Toby Terrell called Bartic plunder. If you go into a lot of um, aquatic ecosystems, then you'll see levels of nutrients are at very low um, amounts. And the reason they're at low amounts is because they're being driven down by the organisms in there. As soon as there's any free or available nutrient, it gets gobbled up very quickly. So in a sense, that's a form of rain control. It's kind of a, an excluding, limiting rain control in that direction. But what about the other way? What about a small increase in this direction? Well, then you have these kind of rapid eutrophication events, some of the things that I've just been talking about. And although this is a cartoon and a, a crude caricature of what happens in a eutrophication event in a shallow uh, freshwater lake, it captures some of the elements because the positive feedback that's produced is largely, I wouldn't say driven, um, life is an important component on it. As the algal blooms increase, then the amount of dead algae that fall down to the bottom of the lake increase, they start to decompose. As they decompose, they consume oxygen. As you get this kind of 
anoxic conditions on the bottom of the lake, that begins to leach out phosphorus, and that phosphorus can then get mixed in the lake, which then can produce more algae, which then die, which then decompose. So you have this positive feedback loop. OK, it's a bit more complicated than a simple Gaussian function with an arrow pointing this way, but it captures an important component of the dynamics, and there's no reason why in higher dimensions, you can't also capture some of the effects that maybe not just the macrophytes or the algae communities are having, but maybe some of the microbial communities too. But the point here is that these are examples of tipping points. So critical transitions, tipping points, and there's been a tremendous and continues to be a tremendous increase in tipping points because the more we understand the Earth system, the more we are beginning to understand its tipping elements within it. So the melt of the Greenland ice sheet or the uh, Arctic sea ice. You know, these are classic kind of systems which if you push them too far, the maybe putative negative feedback processes or at least balancing feedback processes could transition in ways which could lead to relatively sharp transitions to a Arctic which has got no ice in the summer. Or the dieback of the Amazon forest. You drive them hard enough and you'll undertake a whole series of tipping points which are, maybe from our point of view, irreversible. And the thing is, with the impacts of anthropogenic effects on the Earth system, we're not just driving it in a kind of well-mixed global context. So, you know, we are continuing to emit carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere, but we're also in the middle of what some people argue to be one of the greatest mass extinction events in the history of life on Earth. So the current rates of extinction are tens, hundreds, maybe even tens of thousands of times higher than the background rate. And the reason for that is largely of habitat destruction. You know, we chopped down pretty much half the world's tropical rainforest, and by the middle of this century, there'll be maybe 20, 25% left at current rates of deforestation. So these are the biodiversity hotspots in the world, but they're also important stores of carbon. And we've been affecting the hydrological cycle. So this is, or rather was, the Aral Sea, which in a few decades went from being the world's fourth world, the world's fourth largest freshwater lake, to a series of much smaller impoverished lakes, largely because the rivers that were flowing into them were diverted for cash cropping irrigation. So, I said earlier that what humans are doing in terms of their impacts on the Earth system isn't anything new. All organisms necessarily affect uh, their environments. We've just got very good at it. And one of the reasons we got very good at it is because we've been able to um, exploit fossilised carbon. So for the process of photosynthesis, a tree will draw down carbon. And many millions of years ago, a very large number of trees, when they died, they didn't rot, decompose, and then release that carbon back into the Earth's atmosphere. They got buried by sediments. And, and over geological time, through lots of squeezing and heating, that carbon turned into fossil fuels. And it's only been comparatively recently where we as a species have realised that we can dig that stuff up. And then if we dig that stuff up and then refine it and do some other chemistry to it, we can burn it. And in burning it, we release tremendous amounts of energy, which powers our civilization. Unfortunately, it affects the global climate, but that was an inadvertent byproduct. We didn't mean to do that. Um, we did mean to build machines, and with some of those machines, we can build mines. And in some of those mines, we can get phosphorus out of the ground. So we can greatly accelerate the rate of phosphorus that is in the ground into the biosphere. In fact, so much that we will be at risk of exhausting the easily available phosphorus deposits within a matter of decades, perhaps. And then as we throw that phosphorus onto the ground, it ultimately ends up in aquatic environments. And too much phosphorus is a very bad thing with regards to uh, algal blooms. Or in a marine context, some of these things called dead zones, which can take up hundreds, if not thousands, of square kilometers in the oceans. It's not very good. Um, so these kind of impacts that we're having uh, in 2009 were represented in what's proved to be another influential kind of paradigm of our understanding of our impacts, this planetary boundaries concept. So there are nine planetary boundaries, and our impacts are radiating out from the centre of this circle. If it's within the green circle, then there's no immediate cause for alarm. But bear in mind, uh, for these two, uh, aerosols and chemical pollution, they haven't actually quantified it, so we don't know. You can certainly see the areas of concern. Nitrogen cycle. So through burning fossil fuels, we can fix more nitrogen from the Earth's atmosphere than all other biological organisms combined. Um, and this, along with phosphorus, is having some big impacts on these biogeochemical processes. Uh, climate change, of course, but then also biodiversity loss. 
Climate change is hard to reverse. Um, there's lots of technological solutions you could think of. Extinction is irreversible. Once a species is gone, it's not coming back. So some of the work I'm interested in is, is using simple representations of potentially very complicated processes, not at a planetary scale, but a regional scale. So this is something we've got in review. There's John Deering that was leading on that takes the kind of planetary boundaries concept, but now tries to put it into particular regions. So this is a region in China. And as well as these kind of biophysical boundaries, we're also trying to use what was called, what's sometimes called the Oxfam donut. The idea that as well as having an impact on the biophysical processes, humans need to appropriate some of the planet's resources in order that people can actually have a decent life. OK, so, is the Earth alive? Well, it's a productive question. It's a productive question in the sense that it gets us to appreciate how we can understand the Earth as a system. Um, but in one sense, the Earth actually is alive, because one day it will die. In about seven billion years, the, uh, the Sun will expand so much that it will be about as large as the Earth's current orbit. The oceans will boil, the atmosphere will be blown away into space. All that may be left is a molten core, which might itself be subsumed within the sun. But a long time before that, maybe one or two billion years' time, pretty much all life on Earth will cease, because the conditions on the surface of the Earth will no longer be able to support widespread photosynthesis. It will be too hot, and there also won't be enough carbon dioxide. And so with no primary photosynthesis, with no primary production, life on Earth, as we know it, Jim, will uh, cease. However, um, understanding the evolution of the Earth and trying to come up with manageable representations and models and simulations may help us in some way, at least not destroy the Earth, but continue to play some kind of part in its future. My odyssey that I've undertaken for the last 10 years or so has not been alone, so I've been very fortunate to work with uh, uh, a number of collaborators. So these are my co-authors on some of the work that I produce. So thank you very much, them. And thank you very much, you, for your attention. Thank you.